Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Chat episode 212, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mr. Dave Gilbert of Wagedi Games. In this part of the interview, we talk about uh, the Blackwell series, Gemini Roo, lots of other games, and then uh, a lot about Steam and the uh, opportunities and also the dangers of that platform. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Dave Gilbert. Well, in 2003, you started the Blackwell Legacy, which I guess is that, was that uh, Bestowers of Eternity? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> uh, first, and, you know, trying to put the story together here. So. Wow, yeah, uh, you've done your research. Yeah, Bestowers of Eternity was a freeware game that was horrible. <laughs> it was absolutely <laughs> horrible. I tried to wipe it from the internet, but it's impossible. Uh, it's still out there. Um, yeah, yeah, it started with Bestowers in 2003, I think. It was 10 years ago, Jesus Christ, yeah. And the game stars uh, Rosa, a uh, writer who apparently is a, a bit of a medium. Yeah. Oh, you want me to tell you more? Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <Just, laughs> trying to set you up, you know. There's a... Getting up to a question or not. Um, yeah, it's uh, the series is about a um, woman named Rosa Blackwell, uh, who is kind of this, uh, I guess, sort of a bit of a social misfit, kind of um, awkward. Uh, she's trying to make it as a writer, and then her aunt dies, and she discovers that she's from a family of mediums. And she's got the spirit guide in the, in the form of this uh, kind of 1930s um, rat packish ghost named Joey. And their deal is that they meet um, lost spirits and try to help them uh, find their way. And they usually do this by investigating their lives, trying to find out about them and uh, helping them move on that way. And over the course of investigating that kind of thing, they uncover some, some big supernatural thing, which I have, they have to stop. That's the premise of most of the games. So I noticed there's there's four of them so far, with the fifth uh, mm -hmm. in development. Yeah. So how how much has the has the game changed over these various versions? Uh, well, let's see. I think I've gotten better at making games. I think Blackwell Legacy is that was the first game, Blackwell Legacy. I replay it now, and I, all I see is the flaws. People seem to like it. And uh, people even still say they like it. But all I can see is all the mistakes I made where uh, the characters just talk way too much. Uh, not really a lot of gameplay. It's mostly story. And um, the, uh, the main character, I knew she was supposed to be awkward, but I made her a little too awkward. Um, <laughs> these are all criticisms that I've, I've given to myself all over the place. I'm, I'm my own biggest critic of the game. But I think over time, I've sort of given more thought to not just what makes a better story, what makes a better game, but how to mesh the two together. Um, I've always tried to think more about, okay, how does this work as a game? Like, how does this work as an interactive thing? And I think that's, because that's where uh, adventure games are the strongest. It's not just telling a good story. It's about how to make it immersive and how to make it... Um, give the the player more agency in, in what's going on how to make them feel that either it, it's happening to them or it's happening because of them not just it's happening passively um so there, i always give a lot of thought to that um so i think the games have steadily improved with that in mind over the course of the series and the first game i didn't think of any of that stuff so i i look at it now and i wish i could go back and change everything but it's too late um yeah. Yeah, those factors seem to be a problem with lots of uh, adventure games. It's trying to figure out how much exposition do you need. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to go overboard, especially with the dialogue. So I'm kind of oh, wondering yeah. where do you draw the line and like, okay, that's too much dialogue or that's too much exposition. I think if it's something that the player can uncover themselves, then don't just spout out so much dialogue. I think uh, a lot of. Um, a big mistake in a lot of these games is the introduction, where they spend a lot of time introducing the world in non-interactive cutscenes. And I think I draw the line at like five pieces of information. Like you need to tell the player just enough to get them interested in the world and what's going on, and then let them let them loose, let them explore and, and kind of figure it out themselves. Because if you're creating a world, you part of the joy comes from exploring that world. So you don't need to tell the player everything about the world, just let them explore it. Um, it was it was interesting because they were used to these uh, making these casual games like um, mystery case files and things like that. And uh, I never even gave this much thought before. But the interesting thing about adventure game puzzles 
is that you not only have to figure out how to solve the puzzle, often you have to actually go looking for the puzzle itself. You don't know something is an obstacle. You don't quite know that this is an obstacle, that this is a puzzle to be solved. Uh, uh, you don't know it unless you play around and try to you know, experiment and see what happens. And that's sometimes the problem with adventure games is that uh, you're never quite sure what your current goal is. You think, okay, you need, you're trying to find someone, and okay, there's a guard over there who's blocking some building, but you don't know what's in there. But as a seasoned adventure game player, you know, well, something's got to be in there. So you try to get past him, but that's not really a specific goal. It's kind of this nebulous thing of, all right, here's this broad thing I have to do, and here's a guy, here's, here's an obstacle, and so there's got to be something past it. Uh, so it's an interesting... And I think that was an issue, like going back to what I was saying about Gabriel Knight, is that uh, a lot of the first half of the game is just a bunch of obstacles to get past with no real reason to. And I think that is that is a problem that I have a lot of the times with the games I make. Is that, okay, I have this area, okay, there's you know some obstacle or obfuscation or whatever it's called, like something hidden deliberately, um, and you have to solve a puzzle to get past it. But... Sometimes you just never quite. The players lean a lot more direction these days. You need to let them know that there's something here, kind of guide them towards that place. And it's a bit more challenging now to do that without making it, hey, look over here, without making it really obvious. I don't know if I'm making any sense at all, if I'm even answering your question. It's there's no real right or wrong answer. It's just what works. Usually I just design a bunch of things, play it, get it tested, see what the reactions are, and then and then fine-tune it from there is what I normally do. Yeah, I was so thinking, just anyway, right as in. somebody who's developed so many of these and also published so many of these, there must have been several instances where you realized, you know, just by the volume of emails alone about a certain puzzle, you know, this, there's something that went wrong here. What's funny is that I've noticed a lot of times I design, when I design puzzles, I try to keep them very grounded in reality. Um, and there was this one puzzle, I think, in Blackwell Deception, where you're looking for someone's cell phone. And, you know, he was he was last seen in this one particular area, and you're looking for his cell phone. And a lot of people got stuck there. And they'd email me for a hint, and I would just say, well, if when you're looking for a cell phone, what do you normally do? They're like, oh, yeah, right. You call the cell phone. And a lot of people had trouble making that connection, even though it's the most natural thing to do in real life. It's just not something you think of doing within the context of a game. And I found that fascinating. Like, they just didn't think to do that. Or in, uh, I think, Gemini Rue, there's this chase sequence where they, uh, these guys, bad guys are after you, and you're running from them, and you end up in this room. And you close the door, and then they break in. They, if you wait too long, they break the door down. They enter the room, and they shoot you. And they're like, how do I stop these guys? I'm like, well, did you try locking the door? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Never thought to do that. Like, it's, it's just these very ob- the most obvious thing. Like, they'll combine the paper clip with the candle and do all sorts of obscure things, but they won't think to do the very obvious thing, which I found very interesting in the course of making a lot of these. So you don't have any situations like in Gabriel Knight 3 with the cat and the mustache? <laughs> They will never, never hear the end of that. I feel so bad. <laughs> no, I did have a weird dog leash puzzle that a lot of people don't like. But uh, in Blackwell Legacy, you have to get a dog to follow you and then wrap its leash around a pole, and it's stupid. But, yeah. So uh, Blackwell Deception is 2011, right? And is that yeah. is that the game you consider to be the best of the uh, Blackwell um, series? Well, at the time I did. I think every game is... Uh, now that I've been working on Epiphany and I'm loving it so much, I, I look at Epiphany, I look at Deception now, and of course I see all of the flaws. But I think it was the first time I really merged the gameplay and the and the story together really, really well. Uh, I'm very proud of the ending. I'm really proud of the, the story and the characters. I'm really proud about how everything came together. I wish I, um, I didn't skip so much on the graphics. I kind of let the graphics slide to focus more on the gameplay. And I think the game is really strong for it, but everyone complains about the graphics, and I kind of agree at this point. I could have done a better job there, but I think the game is definitely the best. Okay, so 2009, we get Emerald City uh, Confidential, which is, of course, based on the you know Wizard of Oz mm-hmm. uh, canon. So a couple of questions about that. Why, why the Oz canon? 
<laughs> well, um, let's see. I, I've always I was I loved those books when I was a kid, and uh, I read all the original fourteen by L. Frank Baum, and then moved on to the other authors before I uh, before I stopped. And I was always very impressed with the Discworld noir game, where it took uh, Discworld, this very fantasy-ish uh, world, and put this wonderful noir spin on everything. And I always thought to myself, oh, if I ever got the chance, I would love to do that with Oz, knowing it was public domain. And when Play First approached me about doing a game for them, it's the first thing I thought of. And I pitched it to them, and they liked the idea. So um, we went for it. That's got to be huge. I bet people don't realize that, that that's in the public domain. Yeah. Um, the funny thing, the interesting thing is all of the books are in public domain, but the movies aren't. So it's anything that was specific to the movies you cannot use. Like you can't use the ruby slippers because that was the oh, movie, no. <laughs> not the book. You can't actually use Oz in the title, which is bizarre. Um, that's why you have get like Tin Man and Wicked and, and Emerald City Confidential. Um, little things that you just can't use unless they were in the books as well. It's interesting. There's a lot of legal stuff there. But yeah, it was, it was fun to work on. So I think I, I read somewhere where it took you $200,000 to make it. Um, that was the budget. Uh, that's the budget they gave me. Um, a lot of that went to making the engine and the art and uh, uh, a lot of that. Like We had to make an engine from scratch because we were using the, um, the Playground, uh, Play First Toolkit called Playground. So we had to make uh, an engine based in that, which was very, very difficult and took a lot of time. Uh, so that... Um, that was like a quarter of the budget right there was just to make that engine and just you know the time and, and things like that paying everybody it was when you reach that level of um a production value things come become a lot more expensive obviously maybe we should you know back up a little bit so how did you get into this deal with play first oh okay well uh, how did i get into the deal with play first it goes back to the GDC uh, 2006, 2007, rather, when I was nominated for the Choice Award. I got into, um, I got snuck into this party uh, hosted by Play First called the Diner Bash, based on their Diner Dash game, because I think that was the year that they released it, um, or at least the year that it kind of got really successful or something. But uh, the creative director sat me down, and I was really drunk at the time. I didn't take it seriously, and he's like. We really want to do a casual point and click game, and we think you'd be perfect. I'm like, okay, great. And I knew nothing about Play First. I knew nothing about casual games. And I looked at their catalog, and I'm like, I don't make games like this. And I kind of blew it off completely. And then later on, they got back in touch with me. Like, no, we really want you to do this. So I said, oh, okay. And so I almost blew it. Um, so that's how that started. That, that's how that came about. It was an interesting experience because... I came from you know a very old school adventure game background, and they were uh, casual game developers, and they wanted to make an adventure game for the casual audience. And so uh, I didn't really know much about casual games. They didn't know much about old school adventure games. So um, we both, I think, over the course of it, we were kind of second guessing each other. Um, I sort of. Uh, they would give me advice, and I would always do whatever they said. It took all their advice, uh, making it a little bit more casual than it probably should have been. I don't know if you've played the game, but it's very handholdy and very, very easy, even by my standards. And I think that harmed it more than helped it. Uh, but I, st I still love the game. I love the story. I love the art. I love everything about it. I would never be able to make a game with that kind of high production value on my own. So it was really nice to work on. Okay, so let's get to the game, and the, you know everybody, I guess, knows about <laughs> by now. And that's, you know, of course, Jim and I, Ru. Mm -hmm. uh, the cyberpunk game is uh, written, not written by you, though, right? We have a uh, Joshua Nurnberger, I believe. Yeah, Josh Nurnberger. He. Um, so how'd you how'd you meet him and learn about the game? Well, it's uh, kind of goes back even farther than that. I knew that uh, thing about adventure games is that they're very asset heavy. And they take a, a while to make, and they're not—they're very niche. So, um, I realized very quickly after a year or two that each game would have to do really well uh, in order for me to fund the next one and continue living. And I'm—I'm I'm in this for the long haul. I'm in this to earn my living. I don't want to—I'm not just doing this as a, a hobby or as a side thing. Like this is my living. Uh, so, and especially at the time I uh, was engaged, I knew that I knew. 
that I couldn't just, you know, live off of uh, one game at a time and pray it did well. So I decided to get into publishing and I started with Aaron Robinson's Puzzle Bots. And so that was the first game we published. And then I think because of that, I kind of people knew I published games. Josh approached me with Gemini Rue and he said, yeah, you know, I just want to get this done uh, and just not worry about anything afterward. Can you can you take it on? And so I looked at it. My wife and I both played it and we both loved it. And we're like, yeah, well, well we can work on this. So what did, we, what, did, what, did you, what did you like about it? Um, I love the look of it. I love the feel of it. I love the it felt very hardcore. Um, just the subject matter was uh, just very, you know, trench coats, spaceships, rain. And not only that, like it, the story um, kind of worked really well with the environment. And it was really mysterious. Like the whole Delta Six scenario was really interesting. And we were on the edge of our seat. We spent, we were up all night playing it. We loved it. And we just based on our initial impression, we knew this is something that that could take off. And so we said, yes, we would love to take this. Uh, we helped with the voice acting. We got that done. And we uh, helped with the QA. I have a whole team of QA people that help us with our games. I got them playing it. Uh, we paid for some art assets to be made. Um, all the character portraits were um, were made in-house. Well, in-house meaning that we paid for a freelancer to do it, if that makes any sense. And we launched it, and we've been kind of curating it ever since. Uh, we got it... Um, we got it on Steam. We got it ported to uh, iOS. We're working on getting it ported to Mac and Linux right now. So we've just sort of taken it on as ours. And uh, that's really exactly what Josh wanted. He basically gave us this wonderful, wonderful thing, and we've been taking care of it, I guess is the best way to put it. Was that the first of your games on Steam? Uh, no, PuzzleBots actually came first. Okay. PuzzleBots came first. Is that a relatively easy process to get them on Steam, or did you... <laughs> no? Uh, I don't know if you, it's. It seems with every game we launch, uh, there is a little bit of a dance to go through. Uh, they reject us. We prove ourselves in some way, and then they take us again. Puzzlebots, Blackwell, they rejected. Puzzlebots, they rejected. Do they give you a reason why they rejected? Or... No, they never do. That's uh, they. The email uh, never gives you any reason why. Uh, they reject it. They just it's their policy. I can understand why, because they probably would have to deal with countless defensive developers, you know, getting all defensive and things. Uh, so I understand why, but it's still very, very frustrating. Um, yeah, so like PuzzleBots submitted, got rejected, but then it got into the PAX Prime Showcase. They accepted it. Uh, Gemini Rue got rejected, and even despite it being like the number five PC game on Metacritic and being an IGF nominee and, and everything, I ended up having to hire a guy who could go into their office and pitch it to them for me. And they took it. Uh, and then Blackwell got onto Indie Royale uh, when Simon Carlos was involved. And, oh, yeah, um, Simon. Yeah, and so because of like every game on Indie Royale had Steam keys and Blackwell wasn't on Steam, managed to kind of shove it onto Steam that way. Um, Resonance, I pitched it to them. They were kind of iffy about it. So we got like tons of preview coverage. Everything was glowing. We made a pitch and then they, they took it. Primordia, they rejected it, said go to Greenlight. We went to Greenlight. It got shot up to like number 40 in two weeks, which is unheard of. Um, and so then they took it because it rose so fast. Uh, so, and now like with Blackwell Epiphany, uh, they tell me, yeah, we'll, we'll let you know. We'll review it and let you know. So I, I still... Haven't got uh, got got that in yet, which is it's getting a little frustrating, but whatever. It's it's. I mean, is it's, it is it a windfall when they get on Steam, or does it? Yeah, uh, basically, um, right now it's a very awesome place to be in and a very scary place to be in, because Steam is really it. I mean, in terms of um, pure market share, the hearts and minds of gamers, they buy games on Steam. It's almost like Steam isn't Steam is just where they get their games. And it's not really a platform or anything. It's just where people get their games. They think, I want this game. I'll go to Steam and get it. And if it's not there, they just don't. They just won't get it because it's just a very convenient place to store all your games and keep all your games, all your data, all your friend lists and, and achievements and things like that. They want everything on Steam. Uh, it, it's almost like if it's, they don't play it through their Steam client, it doesn't count, which is weird. Uh, and so by not having yeah, the game on Especially for an adventure game, that just doesn't make any sense. 
Yeah, uh, I, it didn't make sense. I didn't quite understand it either. But once it got on Steam, it's not like a, it's a magic bullet. You still have to do all the marketing and, and PR pushing that you would normally do. It's just that more people will be willing to buy it because it's on Steam, uh, which makes it a big windfall for when you can get on there. But it's also a very scary place to be because if they decide they don't want to be indie friendly or they stop taking my games or or something like that, then we're in a very difficult position. We have to figure out, we have to really step up our PR game. Because right now it's very easy just to kind of put everything on Steam. I don't even really try to push things off my own website anymore because it's like 2% compared to all of Steam. Um, so it's a very difficult place to be in because if something happens, what do I do? And uh, I think a lot of developers are, are in that position as well. So Steam is great. Like we're doing really well. We got in there just at the right time where indie games were starting to get really big and we had a really long, nice long tail of games to, to see us uh, through. So we're doing very well, but you know, I, I'm always thinking two or three years ahead. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the third and final installment of my interview with Mr. Dave Gilbert. A lot of great stuff coming up. Uh, also, look at the website, mattchat.us, when you get the chance. We've really been building this up with some great blog posts. We'll be uh, putting some audio podcasts up there soon. And also, you can donate and support the show. really means a lot to me, guys. You can uh, subscribe to the show for a dollar a week or five dollars a month. Doesn't sound like much, and you probably won't miss it, but it does make a huge difference on this end. So thank you, thank you very, very, very much to all those who have supported the show. Now what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got something uh, very, very special indeed. This is the uh, July 2013 Surfside Ale from the, uh, let's see, who does this one? Uh, Lucid Brewing Company. So I've had some of theirs on before. I think I had a Lucid photo uh, several episodes back. A really good one. Uh, they're out of Minnetonka, Minnesota. And the story behind this beer, it's uh, brewed for the uh, Spirit of the Lakes Festival. So it's only brewed just for that festival. So there's very few people uh, that, get, that have access to this. It's actually at the uh, local grocery store here in the uh, they have a guy, uh, I guess it specializes in buying uh, beers like this. So he comes running up to me because he knows I do the reviews on the show. And I uh, wanted me to try this because it is so uh, hard, difficult to find. Apparently those two cases that he bought uh, is it. <laughs> so uh, this might be the uh, first and last time I get to sample this. Anyway, let's get it open. Uh, oh wait, I guess I should give you a little bit more information about it. Uh, let's see, German style lager, 5.5% uh, alcohol, so not too not too bad there. Sailing at sunset, uh, I guess that's the the photo there on the bottle. Anyway, it looks good, but uh, let's get it open and see what it tastes like. All right, so I've got some of this Surfside here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Been smelling it. It's uh, it smells kind of like a wheat ale. Uh, there's some sort of a cherry thing is going there. You can smell a little bit of the hops, but not an overpowering aroma. I hope there's uh, more flavor there than, <laughs> than smell. Anyway, uh, let's give it a go. Uh, what's the... Uh... Okay, a little bit of a kind of a creamy, nutty sort of taste with this. It doesn't taste anything like a wheat ale. Uh, like the I was thinking based on the smell, um, not a lot of uh, flavor here actually. Let me give it another taste. It's kind of a, a little watery, you know, for lack of a better word. Kind of that um, sort of a, that soggy cornflakes kind of flavor that you get with a, a something like a Bud Dry or Bud Ice. Uh, not really enjoying this too much. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, it was better when it was at the festival, but uh, this is just kind of a, a mediocre beer at best. Let me give it one more taste. <laughs> just a very, uh, very watery, not much flavor there at all. Um, I think I'm going to have to have a word with that guy at the grocery store about his uh, taste selections. Anyway, on a scale of one to five, I'm going to go uh, maybe two out of five drinking horns on this. You know, I would prefer this to, uh, I guess, a maker brew. Uh, but definitely, there's so many more 
much better ales out there, especially from Lucid. Uh, go for their Lucid photo uh, instead of this one. It's a uh, hundred times better. Anyway, uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, the quotation, I was looking for quotations about art and mystery. And I came across one by uh, a scientist named Francis Bacon. You've probably heard of him. And it goes something like this. The job of the artist is always to deepen the mystery. See you guys next week. This book, sir, contains every word in our beloved language. Hmm. Every single one, sir? Every single word, sir. Oh, well, in that case, sir, I hope you will not object if I also offer the doctor my most enthusiastic contrafibularities. <laughs>